Greetings, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and welcome to our inaugural session of and the new event series that we're calling Energy Futures Conversations on Where We're Headed. My name is Lissa Polish, and I serve as the statewide director for the Clean Energy Resource Teams, or CERTS. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with CERTS, CERTS is a partnership with a shared mission to connect individuals and their communities to the resources that they need to both identify and then implement community-based clean energy projects. We're hosting this today because honestly, we've been really intrigued by all of the different ideas that are coming forward from folks about their own visions for what an energy future could look like. And we've been really craving an opportunity to dig into those different ideas. And we thought if we're gonna carve out space for ourselves to do, to do that, we might as well invite all of you to join us. So these events are really geared toward helping us all gain some fresh perspectives, sit back and really take in some different ideas about what is this energy future that we're all shaping together hold? And infuse that with, you know, maybe some different ideas than we've heard before. And we hope that over the course of the whole series, this will be an opportunity for all of us to sort of expand our comfort zones around energy futures. So quick logistics, this is how it's gonna go. We're gonna start off with a conversation with our sort of lead sharer as we're describing it. And so today's session, that's Brendan Jordan. And we'll talk for about 20 minutes, get a bunch of insights from Brendan, and then we'll invite in our reactors, Aaron Meyer and Michael Reese for today, to give us a little bit of their perspective. We are hoping that all of you, as you have questions that occur to you as the session moves forward, that you'll just put them in that Q&A little icon down at the bottom of your Zoom window. And then at the end of the session, we're gonna dig in and try to hit as many of those questions as we can before we adjourn. But now keep in mind it's 45 minutes, so it's gonna be kind of rapid fire. And with that in mind, I think that we will go ahead and get going. Um, we are super excited to welcome Brendan Jordan of the Great Plains Institute to our inaugural Energy Futures online event. Brendan is the Vice President of Transportation and Fuels at the Great Plains Institute. And Brendan, I won't read your whole bio because we're gonna dig into some of that as we get going. Um, but we've invited Brendan to come today and talk to all of us about a vision for a low carbon transportation fuel future and what that might mean in terms of both how we get around, but also what that might mean for our communities, farmers, and our landscape. So Brendan, welcome. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me, Lissa. Great to be here. <laughs> Thanks for being our guinea pig. Um, we talked about, we're gonna start with a couple of softball questions just to help people get to know you. Um, so maybe you could start by saying a little bit about what your work is and what you focus on at GPI. Well, I'll try not, at least to not mess up the softball questions. Uh, you, know, you may throw <laughs> me a little later, but um, yeah, Brendan Jordan, I'm, I'm uh, the VP of the Transportation and Fuels Program at the Great Plains Institute. And I, I lead efforts to uh, support policy to, to uh, decarbonize the transportation system. Great Plains Institute where, uh, is a Minnesota-based nonprofit working at the regional and national level to support uh, transformation of the energy system for economic and environmental benefit. And actually, we're really pleased to be one of the partner organizations that helps support CERTs. So um, that's, that's us in a, in a quick nutshell, yep. I love it. And, and I think, um, the partnership is a great way to think about bringing in expertise like yours that may not be always the stuff that goes directly into community, but is really important for where our communities are headed. Um, you know, I, I think it might be helpful for folks to understand how long have you been working on these topics and sort of what is framing your thinking as you come into today? Yeah, that's a, a great question. And uh, it, time, time really flies when you're having fun. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm working, I'm spending a lot of time on a topic called a clean fuels policy, also known as a low carbon fuel standard. And it's actually my second go round. So uh, working with the Midwestern Governors Association about 12 years ago, we had a regional effort looking at that exact same type of policy. And now there's growing interest in it again, which dates me a bit. You know, I, uh, Lisa, we first met uh, in grad school at the Humphrey Institute, which was, I, I would say, around uh, 2003 or four, And I was really pretty focused on these issues at that point. So I have been at it for a while and I've seen a lot of change in, you know, certain technologies come into vogue and maybe, maybe they fizzle, maybe they keep going. 
but you know, the kind of the common thing I, I see is the portfolio approach. It's going to take, uh, there's not just one perfect solution. It's going to take a lot. And I, that's kind of reinforced by many years of working on this and see certain, seeing certain trends come and go. I swear that we were going to focus on how young we are, not that we got old somehow in the process. Here, I'm, I'm, but. St I'm still young. Yeah. <laughs> so are you? Yeah. Thank you. Um, so one of the things that you and I have talked about a lot, and I, I look to you as sort of my guide on this is to really think about defining what low carbon transportation fuels are. And I think probably for our whole group, really helping people think about what does that mean? What does it not mean? Mm -hmm. um, like, is it just liquid fuels? Is it beyond that? Can you help define that for us before we get too far in? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we, we could certainly define fuels more broadly. And of course, uh, gaseous and liquid fuels are used beyond the transportation sector. Uh, we use natural gas for, for heating and industrial uses. You know, that's the big other area. Um, and, uh, you know, petroleum tends to mostly be a transportation story, although we used to generate more electricity with petroleum decades ago. But, yeah, you know, for, for purposes of, of my work, you know, I'm, I'm pretty focused on transportation. It is now in Minnesota the largest uh, emitting sector. And it's a, we've in Minnesota made a lot of progress on uh, decarbonizing the electric sector. We've made great progress putting more renewables on the system. And we've made some progress in transportation, but not, not as much. Um, so we've had some great early innovation in the transportation sector in Minnesota, deploying uh, uh, biofuels. We're just kind of getting started with EVs. And there's a, there's a lot of other ideas, but ultimately the goal is by mid-century to move to a zero or negative carbon transportation sector, which will require us to deploy pretty rapidly a whole variety of different low carbon full, you know, and what do I mean by low carbon? Low carbon transportation fuels are, it, it means that, you know, there's low emissions in every part of the life cycle. So if it's biofuels, you got to lower emissions on the farm and in the biofuel plant and using the thing. EVs, you got to lower emissions from the electric grid, which we're doing, making good progress on in Minnesota, and manufacturing the vehicle and the batteries and, and, uh, and the use. You could apply that same kind of thinking to renewable natural gas. Well, great, we can reduce emissions a lot by capturing methane that might otherwise be emitted. We get credit for that. And, and so it's a, it's a whole... People talk about full life cycle thinking, and, and we really have to do that kind of thinking in the transportation sector. That's, that's really helpful. I mean, I, I think sometimes when we start talking about transportation, it's easy to just default um, <laughs> to thinking about liquid fuels. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think that that's good for people to sort of have as a grounding. So with that backdrop, maybe talk to us about the vision. Like, what does this low carbon transportation fuel future really mean for, for I mean the, the fuels, obviously, but really what, like, what does that mean for people and, and the folks that are doing that work? Mm -hmm. Can you say a little bit more about that? Well, I would say the elements of this vision are uh, we can have a system that offers us uh, better air quality there's a lot of air quality issues related to our current system that involves burning a lot of fossil fuels, sometimes in concentrated locations, for example, along interstate corridors and in cities, there's concentrated impacts of air quality. Uh, so we, we can eliminate that issue. Um, it's a system that still contributes to the economy and jobs. We can produce um, a, a lot of our fuels in our state, in our region, in a way that we don't today. We refine fuels in our region, but we don't produce them. So we could get a lot more economic benefit out of the billions of dollars <laughs> that we spend on transportation fuels every year. Why not keep more of that benefit in our state? And finally, we can, we can have a, a, a system that is more innovative uh, by developing new low carbon technologies. And, and you know, finally, this is a, there's an opportunity for a system that saves money for consumers. 
um, as these technologies uh, get introduced and as, as innovation occurs, uh, there's a real opportunity for people to pay less. So, you know, one example is electric vehicles. People talk a lot about how, you know, today uh, electric vehicles are a bit more expensive upfront. The purchase price can be a little bit more. That's dropping fast. And they are already in many applications cheaper to fuel because electricity is cheaper than gasoline and cheaper to operate because they're lower maintenance. Now, over time, it's just going to be cheaper to buy. And, and you know, that's true for uh, certain biofuels. You see certain biofuels that are cheaper. Um, and really, it's just a market access problem uh, to get more of that into the gas tank. And so we could kind of apply that to other fuel types. I think innovation is going to offer a lot of benefit to people. It's going to give them something better and cleaner. Yeah. So saying a little bit more about that market access part, because you know, one of the things that I know people think about is like the renewable fuel standard or even, you know, sort of EV tax incentives. And that's trying to create market access. How would you contrast, you know, what a low carbon transportation fuel policy would do against that? Well, I think we have to, we have to look at two issues. One of them is, is the infrastructure. Uh, actually, let's say three issues. One is the infrastructure, one is the vehicles, and one is the, the, the incentives. And so, you know, there's a, you know, a lot of great work. I won't pretend to be an expert on the infrastructure side, but, you know, the, the biofuels industry and egg, egg sector in Minnesota and other states are doing great work to try to, you know, create more room in the gas tank for biofuels, for example. But, you know, you just look at ethanol. Well, you, you can only go so far. You can put 15% in a 2001 or newer vehicle. And, and we have some vehicles that are flex fuel that, but you know, we do need to look at, you know, creating more space in the gas tank. If we want to use more biofuels, you can tell a same, similar kind of story about biodiesel. Um, and we've done, done great work there. Um, you know, there's also that, so there's that infrastructure story too. Is there a place to charge your EV? Is there a place to refuel? Uh, your vehicle with the kind of biofuel blend you're interested in. But finally, there's the consumer side. And a, there's a policy that we're really focused on uh, called the clean fuel policy. This is a, otherwise known as the low carbon fuel standard. Uh, California uh, created a similar type of program about a decade ago. And there's been a couple rounds of interest in the Midwest in looking at, could this be applied in our region I think initially a, a fair bit of skepticism from Midwestern stakeholders about this program. It's a California thing and we get suspicious of the California Air Resources Board. But uh, what, what I think has become clear over time is that it's really a program that has uh, offered a lot of benefit to, to Midwestern fuel producers. Um, ethanol and biodiesel have uh, gotten exported into that market and generated a lot of incentives from a credit trading program. So, and, and California has kind of changed their view too. They've kind of realized, oh, well, the biofuels, maybe that wasn't our first choice, but this really helping contribute to real reductions. And so there's been a, a we've led an effort, uh, really stakeholder driven, including biofuels industry, EV sector, NGO community, renewable natural gas, to look at, you know, okay, we're not gonna rubber stamp California, but if we were gonna look at a similar uh, type of program design, how would we do this differently in the Midwest? How would we design this really around Midwestern resources, Midwestern industries, and design a program that really works for our economy? And so that's been a, a great project. We've released a set of recommendations in January. Uh, we have, there's a white paper available. There's my little pitch for my, uh, for my book tour or something. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, we're, we're doing a lot, a lot of great discussion. That's an issue that's being discussed as part of the, the Governor's Council on Biofuels in Minnesota. Um, it's being discussed in a number of other states as part of uh, climate task force discussions. And so I, I think it is, it is uh, what's exciting about it is it creates this portfolio approach where it's not picking, well, we're just, we're EV people and that's all we like, or we're just about biofuels. It's a technology neutral market-based program that offers uh, incentives to any fuel that's able to meet certain carbon performance targets. And our research suggests all those types of fuels are gonna compete 
and do well under this type of program? Yeah, so let's let's think. Like, I got a couple of follow up questions on that. Absolutely. Um, yeah. One of the one of the things that I hear from people. So, um, a number of us participated in a session um, that our colleagues at Agricultural Utilization Research Institute hosted recently, and they talked about hydrogen and ammonia, um, mm -hmm. and sort of those as new entrants into this market. And you you talked at the very beginning about seeing fuels that have come into vogue and mm -hmm. then, you know, maybe faded back or not. And I know that when we were in grad school, there was a lot of conversation about hydrogen mm -hmm. and it faded away a little bit, but it seems like it's really coming back. So how does something like that as like a new entrant mm -hmm. fit into this kind of thing? Yeah, so there's there's a couple of ideas there. One is the idea of using hydrogen as an energy carrier and which is you can use it in a fuel cell vehicle and have zero emissions. And as long as you can have low emissions upstream producing the hydrogen, it's a very low emission technology. Um, people talk a lot about hydrogen, you know, as an opportunity for, let's say we're talking about long haul trucks, a little bit harder to charge batteries that big, you know, not that we necessarily won't, but it, it's another opportunity. Instead of a battery, you, you maybe have a hydrogen tank and a fuel cell and you use that to power what is still an electric vehicle, but it might be a, 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 an option for fueling kind of these long haul trucks. The ammonia thing is very interesting. Mike is gonna tell us more about that, I bet, but you can produce ammonia from hydrogen that you can produce through renewable processes. Actually, that, that impacts us in a number of ways, right? You could actually use that as a fuel, which would, have, uh, would be a, a low emission fuel because you're just taking uh, nitrogen out of the air to make the fuel and you're just releasing it back into the air. Mike, I'm probably dumbing that down. Mike can explain it better. But the other thing is we use a lot of ammonia um, in agriculture. And if you look at the full life cycle emissions of biofuel production, you could lower those by using renewable ammonia as your, as your fertilizer. So it actually can help other fuel types as well. So that's, then that's exciting. And that's exactly this type of, type of policy supports innovation and new entrants into the market. Yeah, no, I love that. Thank you. Um, you know, one of the questions that we've been hearing from folks after the white paper came out, and we'll be sure to share that in the, the follow up for everybody. Um, but one of the questions we've been getting is like, what does this sort of thing look like for farmers? What does it look like for a rural economy for something like this to happen? And then maybe speak to also what does it look like in an urban economy? Like how does this sort of play out at those different levels? Yeah, so uh, starting with rural, uh, so, so there's a few, a few ways in, this could, in, w in which this could offer value. I mean, uh, by supporting uh, the biofuels industry, you know, if you would see more incentives going to biofuel plants that are innovating and figuring out strategies to lower their carbon intensity, um, that's, that's just value that, you know, when people do economic analysis, they say, well, you've got your direct impacts, that's jobs at the plant, but, you know, you've got indirect People working at that plant spend money uh, on healthcare and restaurants and services. So you have these indirect and induced impacts as well. Uh, and so having a healthy biofuels industry, I think, is, is good for rural communities, has been good for rural communities. There's another question, and this is complicated, and we don't have all the answers for how to do this. But if you lower, there's a lot of great work happening to figure out how to introduce, reduce tillage, cover cropping systems, precision agriculture, nitrogen inhibitors, all these things you can do on the farm that are great for so many reasons, for soil health um, and, uh, you know, all these other things. But they all also offer some greenhouse gas benefit. Now, the question is, can you take credit value? You know, you're making ethanol from that corn more valuable to an ethanol producer because you're helping that plant be lower carbon, how do you make sure that farmers get some of that value? And so that's, a, that's something we're working hard to figure out uh, and uh, working with a lot of stakeholders from the agriculture and biofuels sector and uh, ARS scientists to really get a handle on what does the science tell us? How could we design a program that has credibility and, and really offers, you know, we're really paying for the benefits that we're getting. And then you asked me about urban, but I could, yeah. if we have time, I no, can. No, go ahead. Uh, okay. I think we have time. Go ahead. Yeah, well, I, I mean, uh, a clean fuel program, you know, by supporting investment in new clean fuels, it, it, it will support the economy. And so we talked about air quality. Well, let's find some ways to reduce 
air emissions that are causing asthma and, and cancer and other, other problems, particularly in, in minority communities that, that are disproportionately impacted by air pollution um, and low income communities. Um, you know, saving money on fuel is a good thing for everybody. <laughs> The other thing is a, a clean fuel policy is structured to avoid uh, imposing uh, cost increases on consumers, and which is going to be a sensitive issue as well for low income communities. And we want to avoid that. And a lot of these things do come to down to being careful and deliberate about policy design, making sure you're taking into account all these different points of view. And I think you can, you can design around a lot of potential issues that might come up. No, and I, I mean, I really appreciate that because I, I mean, I think it speaks to the sort of nuance with a, with a policy, any kind of policy, and thankfully CERT doesn't do policy. I'll just remind everybody of that. But mm -hmm. um, I, I think it speaks to really needing to bring in those different viewpoints. And, and so with that as my lead in and transition, <laughs> let's go ahead and bring in a couple of other viewpoints. Um, I mean, Brendan, this was such a great, just sort of, 101 about what does this look like and what do we need to think about and I think you know as my brain starts to spin you know I want to hear from Aaron Meyer and Mike Reese and I'll ask you to both to turn on your video um, to sort of give some of their thoughts and reactions to what they're hearing and so I'm going to do bios for you both and then Aaron will have you start. Um, Aaron Meyer is the director of Greenland's Blue Waters, a collaborative initiative focused on shifting the agricultural landscape of the upper Mississippi River Basin to more acres of marketable, continuous living cover to improve water quality, soil health, agricultural and community resilience, and the long-term stability of the basin all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. Um, I'll just add, Erin and I worked together for years through the Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships where I'm based, and she is also a real geography nerd, so we'll see if that comes out or not. Um, and Erin, hold on for just a second while I introduce Mike, but um, Mike is the Director of Renewable Energy at the University of Minnesota West Central Research and Outreach Center. Mike has been there a little bit longer than I have been in my position, just about 20 years, I think, um, and has really led the charge on the renewable energy programming out in Morris really thinking about everything from wind energy and biomass gasification, renewable hydrogen um, and ammonia that Brendan teed up for you, um, and has been leading a new strategy to reduce fossil energy consumption and agricultural production systems um, by incorporating renewables and efficient energy technologies. So Mike, we'll get to you in just a second. Erin, you have been so gracious to do this with us because we know that you're not a transportation person, but that's actually why we invited you. Um, I, I, I know this is outside your scope of work, in some ways, but also maybe kind of aligned with what Green Letter, Greenland Blue Waters thinks about toward continuous living cover, supporting farmers with adopting those practices. Give us a sense, sort of, what are you thinking about as you listen to this? What questions or insights might you share? Yeah, thank you. Well, thanks for the invitation because, um, yeah, there are, are all sorts of overlaps that I don't necessarily have my eyes on, you know, focus completely on this sector. Um, and I think Brendan brought up a number of kind of the nuances that, that I'll probably give voice to right now. Um, I kind of mapped out my uh, comments as a response to what I thought about as I read the Clean uh, Fuels Policy Framework. Um, so it's kind of buckshot and I know I have about three minutes, so I'm gonna just go. I will say there's a lot to like about the framework as I consumed it. Um, I especially like there's a piece in there about uh, articulating an exception to the rule that states could and should consider setting aside a percentage of credit revenue to invest in good agricultural practices. So that to me is, is my entry point. Um, but I won't go there right away. I want to mention a few kind of cautions and concerns that came to mind as I read it and kind of consumed some of the language and, and, and uh, you know, did some of my own research. But Certainly there's a lot of elegance to a tech neutral approach. Uh, the most attractive CIs, however, may not encourage or result in the best ag, you know, system options <clears throat> for specific farms or even in a mix across an agricultural landscape. So that's something I would be concerned about. Um, there are some indications that focus, that a focus on carbon-based valuations would favor and reward bigger farms. So out of the gate, a policy might not be farm scale neutral without making it so by design. 
Um, I, I realize that we kind of want to put this aside, but I still think the displacement of food and fiber production should be considered, especially in terms of avoiding increasing the already dangerous momentum of converting intact grasslands and natural ecosystems to agriculture. So the plow, the plow print report uh, from the World Wildlife Foundation recently came out. In 2018, we saw again an increase to 2 million acres of intact grasslands in North America plowed under for row crop production. So, you know, how would a, how would a policy framework like this increase that possibly as an unavoided, you know, a, a consequence that might not have been planned for? Um, Brendan did mention, and I want to emphasize that area of future work in the report that warns of systems that could create loopholes preventing credit value from reaching farmers. We've seen a lot of, uh, you know, ideas come and go about uh, incentivizing farmers for various behaviors or practices. So we certainly don't want to create a system that promises support, but then those benefits go to others along the supply chain and then leaving farmers empty handed. Um, and importantly, though I know this is just part of the CI, we don't really know yet. And the science is getting, you know, more and more urgent about truly measuring soil carbon sequestration and how to attribute carbon sinks to specific production methods, especially over space and time. So there's my geography. We do know that it's, it's field to even acre specific. So as well as very, very highly dependent on weather and weather events. So this is high resolution stuff that is super hard to measure in value. And that brings an authentic CI for ag in, into some question, especially over time if we're building markets around it. Um, although I have to admit, of course, that we use carbon sequestration metrics for current, you know, co-pays and other reward systems to shift agricultural practices. So we're all in this together. This, that, that piece is not just about uh, transportation fuels. But if I get back to the ag credit side, um, set aside thing, I certainly would like to see more incentives baked in for continuous living, cover diverse farming systems, feedstocks like prairie grasses, you know, the DOE continues to fund an enormous amount of biomass research that you all probably know better than I, but in places like the University of Illinois. Um, you know, let's actualize this work uh, for a Midwest policy. Penny, Crest, and Camelina are uh, forever green crops that we continue to uh, research. They have the potential, as many know, for jet, as a jet fuel feedstock, very interesting. Methane, though not a liquid transportation fuel, uh, but certainly for electric production. And, and I'm not sure how viable that conversion of gaseous methane is, um, but there's some tremendous work going on um, just south of us at Iowa State University. Take a look at the Sea Change Initiative, just was, was awarded a USDA $10, $10 million grant to work on advancing bio-based value chains around the production of reno renewable natural gas with diverse feedstocks, which could be grasses or you know outputs from perennial systems. Um, <laughs> And then, you know, although this framework is not about corn only, I realized I have to take the opportunity to say, you know, it is beyond time to be thinking beyond corn. Uh, even more quote unquote sustainable corn, there's a whole world of opportunity for agriculture to be innovative and environmentally and socially beneficial. So I'd sure like to see a clean fuels policy that does not incentivize corn production. Although I have to admit, again, in Ames at uh, Iowa State University, there's some very interesting things happening around symbiotic corn and perennial ground cover systems, though I don't think those would feed into a, a biofuel scheme. Mm, um, yeah. So, you know, this is all good. I think this framework holds just <laughs> a ton of promise. Um, I would like to see it, you know, use it to drive farm field and fitting productive continuous living cover, what we like to say roots in the ground all year round type of agriculture that helps do all the things that we want and, and that agriculture can do, clean our waters, nurture our soils, benefit wildlife, often climate, you know, offer climate change sinks to mediate the chaos, provide economic stimulus to our communities. And really, even at a landscape scale, we could be growing a lot more nutritious feedstocks into the food system uh, for our bodies. So if a clean fuels policy can be a tool in the toolbox to help blanket the Midwest agricultural mm -hmm. landscape in a diverse, vibrant perennial farms, you know, I, I'm all for it. So I think there are a lot of possibilities. Yeah. yeah, thank you. And I think it's really helpful to get um, that sort of landscape perspective, but, yeah. you know, also sort of understanding some of that science. And just for people that were wondering what CI meant is carbon intensity. Is thank that you. right? Okay, good. Yeah, thanks. Well, I'm um, just using your lingo, man. <laughs> I know. I don't know all about, about CIs. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. How many acronyms can we put forward in a session? Thank you so right. much, Erin. I just really appreciate that. Yep. Um, 
All right, Mike, so you're up next. Um, I introduced you with your lead role as a researcher, but it might also be helpful for people to know that you are a farmer. Um, and I know you've been doing so much work on so many strategies around farm resilience. And just what kind of insights and ideas, questions do you bring as you sort of have been listening to this as we go? Thank you, Lisa. And, and by the way, I, I think I knew you when you are in grad school, when you are working on the idea for certs. And just wanted to say that you haven't changed over the 20 years. So, <laughs> so just with that, uh, going a little bit, uh, you know, our, our role at the West Central Research and Outreach Center, as far as our renewable energy program is concerned, is to try to reduce fossil energy consumption, production, agriculture. And Brendan alluded a little bit into uh, that. Uh, we, we look at trying to uh, replace the fossil energy with, with renewables throughout the whole system. And we do life cycle assessment on corn and livestock production and, and other grains as well. And so if you look at corn production, uh, grain drying and nitrogen fertilizer, at least in our case, are the two largest contributors to fossil energy, to the fossil energy footprint. And so if you can have a system where you can use wind energy or solar energy and produce uh, the nitrogen fertilizer that goes on the crops, you know, then, then all of a sudden the, uh, life cycle looks a lot better for not only corn, but also for meat and also for ethanol. And so our, in our process, we have a pilot plant right now where we use wind energy to produce hydrogen and then convert it to ammonia. And recently that, that process has gained a lot of tension for, for storing energy and moving, moving it around. Uh, because, and Lisa, you mentioned that hydrogen kind of comes and goes, uh, and that's true. I think uh, the same could be said with wind and solar. Uh, solar PV, you know, came in uh, with uh, Jimmy Carter's presidency and then quickly went out with Ronald Reagan's presidency, at least in terms of the White House. But uh, it, it took a while for that tech technology to be developed. And I think in the hydrogen sector, it took a while for the understanding that uh, ammonia could be used as an energy carrier and so it, it makes the storage of, of hydrogen much easier and the seasonal storage of hydrogen much easier to convert it to ammonia. Uh, and so you can use, as Brent alluded to, and our colleagues in Germany, they call it power to gas, where you're using wind energy to convert it to a gas like hydrogen or ammonia. And then, they, then they also say sector coupling. So in Brennan's example, where you can produce uh, hydrogen and ammonia and it'll impact biofuels uh, carbon intensity, but you can also use that, uh, you know, that, that ammonia for, to produce electricity uh, later on, or could you be used for thermal energy? You can uh, crack it to produce hydrogen again and use it in vehicles. And so the nice part about that whole process is that we're also working on, you know, electric cars, we're moving more into electric vehicles. Once you have an electric vehicle platform, it's much easier to, to add in a fuel cell and convert it uh, to run on hydrogen. And so that's kind of an interesting aspect. Uh, there has been discussion about using ammonia as a fuel. In fact, we demonstrated using ammonia, renewable ammonia in a John Deere tractor. And so there's that possibility, but I think uh, when people talk about ammonia as a fuel, most see it in terms of transportation as cracking it back into hydrogen or, or in larger applications like a train or a, a ship. And so uh, worldwide, there's a tremendous amount of interest in using ammonia as a, as a fuel in these larger applications. And it, it's very similar to solar and wind. For, for you know, many years, we've heard that wind and solar were far too expensive. And then it seemed almost overnight, we hit that tipping point, and now they're the, they're the least cost uh, you know, fuel for or, or least cost energy uh, source for utilities. And, and I think that's what we're gonna see uh, with these other fuels too, is that overnight, we're gonna see a major shift. And, and if people out there want to, you know, say, want to move in this direction right now, you know, and mm -hmm. maybe electric vehicles aren't an option for you, E85, I mean, we have E85 in Minnesota, uh, have over 40% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, all the dollars, most of the dollars stay local. Uh, so, I, and it's actually usually 
less costly to put E85 in than gasoline, especially when prices are high. It's, it's, you know, they, uh, the E85 industry uh, essentially makes sure or has uh, a system where where they try to keep it lower than than uh, gasoline because it you know and, and admittingly E85 will give you less miles, but that's already factored into the price, so it should be a good better value for you as well. Mike, thank you so much. And and you did bring up something that I, I meant for us to address, but when we're talking about transportation fuels, we are thinking about more than just like the auto that you drive, right? We're thinking about rail, marine, transit, aviation, all of that. So that was, thank you for adding that. Okay, we have a few different questions that are coming in. Um, the very first one that came in, and Brendan, I think this is to you. How do we convince Subaru to not void warranties when E85 is used? E15 is used. Right now, they don't support it. Okay, Brendan, go fix that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, of course, the automakers have taken different approaches to that. Um, uh, the approval of E15 for uh, 2001 uh, and newer vehicles is is an EPA decision, but uh, the automakers have, have been able to, you know, make their own pronouncements about their warranties. Um, I don't know what more to say about that. No, that's, that's fair. Um, so one of the things, you know, Aaron brought up was about acreage um, and thinking about sort of the, the acres for corn and then thinking about the food and fiber questions. And, you know, they're age-old questions around food versus fuel, but help us think about some of that and what you're seeing in terms of potential around this yeah. kind of approach. Well, I, I'll say at a high level, I, I think there's, um, there's some more analysis we could do on this topic. But I think if you look at ethanol, for example, today, uh, what you see is, uh, you know, corn yields increase about 1.1% per year. And so over time, you can produce more ethanol on the same acre of land. At the same time, at the federal level with the renewable fuel standard, the volumetric obligations have been uh, have been reduced through small refinery exemptions. And so I, I think today what, you know, the situation is probably decreasing uh, land use intensity of biofuel production. And you, you sort of, through yield increase, you do create opportunities to produce more fuel on the same acre. Um, the, the other thing is I, I think that I appreciate Aaron raising penny crests and other opportunities for, you know, sort of a double cropping systems that offer a lot of environmental benefits while potentially creating an opportunity for a second biofuel crop on that same acre. But I, I do think, you know, that's important, right? I, I think it's not acceptable to a lot of, of uh, stakeholders to see m massive increases in land used to produce biofuels. And I think we can model what the impacts of a policy would be over time. The other thing to keep in mind too is there, there are limits on the ability of biofuels to expand. Uh, right now we've got a, a little more room to get up to E15. We've got a little more room to use more E85 and flex fuel vehicles. But meanwhile, flex fuel vehicles are sort of exiting the marketplace. So that market is shrinking. Uh, the, the ethanol industry is very interested in, in some sort of a mid-level like E30 blend, but that would take time to deploy. And we also have electrification coming online, which could shrink the gasoline pool. So in my view, there's a sweet spot here where by allowing increased uh, blending and balancing out some of these other factors, we can see, see some, some growth in, in biofuel use in a way that's beneficial to the industry, but is, is not so fast that it's you know, resulting in land use conversion. Um, so it's sort of right. what's, that, what's that Goldilocks just right and how, you know, how do we model it and, and how do we put safeguards in place to address the very real concerns that, that Aaron has raised? Yeah, no, I, I think that that's really helpful. Um, uh, one of the other questions in here, and I, there are a couple of different questions and we had a couple others that we wanted to hit on, but one of the questions that came up was looking at um, this clean fuels policy for the Midwest. What were you finding in terms of interactions then with other policies like California's like what does an incentive here mean to a low carbon fuel producer 
selling into a Midwest market as opposed to a California market. And just, I'm just thinking about what you were just saying and sort of the interplay then of like multiple states having incentives or, or that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Yeah. Well, at a, at a high level, we need to create a larger market for clean fuels if we want to see the kind of innovation that we need. And so California is 10% of the fuel market. We, we need to see these types of policies in more jurisdictions. Um, yeah, sure, sure, some fuels get traded, and, but you know, at the same time, there's, there's more capacity for the fuel market to deliver carbon intensity reductions than is represented by one state. Mm -hmm. um, and, and not yeah. all fuels get transported. You're not gonna ship electricity you know, for EVs to California. We're gonna, you know, that's a huge untapped market in Minnesota that we could capture, help capture through a policy like this. Mm -hmm. Well, and if it encourages sort of to, to Aaron's point, opportunities for other cropping systems or enough ecosystem services. And, and maybe, you know, maybe you all can comment Mike and Aaron, maybe in particular, but from your perspective, like what is, how much do ecosystem services have to be work worth to be able to offset some other practice or what does that need to look like? Yeah, I'm not sure where you're getting at in terms of like changing practices. Mm -hmm. on the land. Like how much does a farmer need to know that they're going to make to have that be a viable? Oh yeah. Oh, they've got it. It's gotta be pretty hardwired in. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I mean, even, you know, even the challenge of trying to get cover crops into our two main row crop, um, you know, crops in the Midwest has taken at least three decades of some seriously focused effort. So yeah, I mean, I mean, those incentives have to be hardwired in. There has to be a benefit, um, and and I can't stress either. GLB Greenlands Blue Waters does a lot of work on the supply chain because we have to be pulling, you know, those markets to develop and uh, pull these kinds of practices and crops on the and the landscape. So I think there's a lot of similarity there uh, with you know what what we would have to do for biomass if we just look at biomass for clean fuels policy would have to be building. Mm -hmm those markets, whether they're for ecosystem services or for the final product. Yeah. So I don't know right. if I'm answering your question, but yeah. No, I think that that's actually really helpful. Sort of you, as you were thinking about like, other marketable pathways. So <coughs> that's really Lisa, helpful. Lisa, from my yeah, standpoint, I, I believe it, it probably would have to be in the range of a hundred dollars an acre. So just to give you an idea that that's net, net, net profit. So if you have a 500 acres, 500 acre or a thousand acre farm, and so we're talking about trying to develop a livable wage. So it'd be $50,000 or $100,000. And, you know, keep in mind that agriculture farming today has tremendous amount of risks where combines are $300,000 plus investments. Tractors is the same. Land is $5,000 an acre. And so, and you're dealing with very small margins the way it is. So mitigating the risk through these, through these payments would be essential to, to, for farmers to, to move into that area. Right now you can't yeah. get crop insurance, for example, on um, right. penny crests, wheat grass, right. or, or right. anything like that. So yeah. th there needs I mean, to we're be a tremendous amount of policy and, and not only policy, but there needs to be a complete infrastructure where today you can take corn and soybeans to an elevator and sell them right when you bring them up there, or you can go on uh, the board of trade and you can, and you can uh, use futures to market your grain and those are not available at this time for a lot of the other uh, specialty crops. So that would all have to change as well. And I would just add to that. I, I appreciate that, Mike. I mean, that risk profile is where, where do you, what can you fill in, <laughs> you know, to, to uh, pay for the risk? I mean, there are some really successful programs of, you know, private investments and, and then like a public payer of like a water system happening through Iowa soybean. And they're very pleased with $37 an acre return, but those farmers are doing other things to, to maybe fill in the, the 100, you know, the difference between 37 and 100 that you're describing. Um, <laughs> but, but that program is growing and, and there are farmers lining up for it. They don't have the funding through that mechanism yet, but 37 is, is bringing farmers to the door. So just want to throw yeah. that out. Yeah. And I'll, I'll just briefly mention that, you know, it's no wonder, given the numbers that you just said, why farmers are interested in having um, solar leases um, and leases on their landscape. 
Um, friends, we are nearly at time. There are a couple of other questions and we'll try to answer these in a follow-up note to everybody around some battery technology and particulate matter emissions around ammonia. And then of course, around this concept of energy sheds and, and our friend Troy Goodmill is asking that. And Troy, I'm just gonna tell you right now, we're hoping that at some point you might host a conversation on energy sheds and how that might change this dynamic. I, I am just grateful to, to the three of you for being willing to do this, for the pre-work that went into it, but also just for, for doing this today. And thank you to all of you who joined. Um, we really wanted to try something new and try something that might just help us think about some of these topics a little bit differently, get a few different ideas into our brains, but also some different um, perspectives on those ideas. So I hope that we were able to do that with you today. Um, as this meeting closes out, there will be a quick evaluation that will pop right up. We encourage you to do that. It will also encourage you to go register for the next event in our series, which is on October 21st from 3 to 3.45, and it will focus on energy and housing. Um, and we'll be featuring Jody Flick from Equilibrium 3, Jacob Mann from the University of Minnesota, and Mauricio Leon from the Met Council. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Brendan and Mike and Aaron. I really appreciate it. Thanks for the Have a great afternoon, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye.